1,152, 1,153. Rude. But he's just going to sit there and look at me the whole time, not even make your presence known. No, hey, hi, hello, how you doing? I don't know about that. We're all here for the same reason, right? We're looking for Chainsaw Man. He's clearly not in this room. But, 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 don't, don't leave yet. I may know where he is. Or at least I may know things that you probably have to face before you get to him. Valuable information comes at a cost. Are you willing to pay it? With time. This chapter is one of the most stupid that we've had in a while. In a fun way, in a playful way, not in a bad way, but in a good way. The reason I think it's stupid is because it's very playful. It's very chaotic, energetic, fun. It's just silly and quirky, really. Every describing word that you can get. It doesn't really take the general threat or the situation that they're in seriously. And when you look at the cast of characters that we currently have, I guess that makes sense. Higashi, or Kobeni's brother, kind of kicks things off in a way that is fun, a little bit panicky, a little bit over the top. He's just trying to leave. Everyone else is looking for Chainsaw Man, he wants to go home. So he opens up a door, not knowing if it's the exit. A bunch of pseudo Chainsaw Men are inside. Not the brightest thing to do, almost getting himself killed, uh, but someone does arrive. It's the mysterious eye patch dude that we originally saw a couple of chapters back, saying that he would be the one to kind of look over Chainsaw Man, so we must be getting closer if he has appeared. Question time, where did this guy come from? Did he materialize in front of everyone? Did no one see that he was there? Can he teleport around the base? Am I overthinking this too much? Most likely. It's weird that no one really seen him. So, skeptical? I enjoy the perspective that he brings forward. It's emotionally charged, one that's very personal to himself, but also ironic and contradictory. Obviously, he's not happy with these pseudo-like chainsaw men, and he's curious on what actually triggers this transformation. So he's a little bit envious and annoyed that some people are getting transformed, and others are not. His wife was actually one of them to get transformed, and he's irritated that the people he was connected with, that he loved, that he enjoyed, unfortunately turned. But the people that he hated, Old Man Next Door, Kishibe question mark, or just Chainsaw Man Club in general, they have not transformed. So it brings up the question, why? How? Is there a reason to any of the madness? Is there levels or specific things that have to be acquired before you get turned into Chainsaw Man? Now we know bits and pieces of that information, but nothing very concrete. He goes on to spout this black and white nonsense. He didn't deserve this. His wife didn't deserve this because she treated her so well and vice versa. But he claims that he's never done any wrong in his life. And that is what brings up a pretty interesting conversation, especially when you take the black and white viewpoint that Asa Mitaka has on this world. Asa has always been in this realm of not knowing what is right or wrong. It's extremely black or white. There's never any gray or in the middle. It's always been fluctuating. The fact that she has a character that majority of the time sits in the wrong, connected with her, being War and Yoru, and then Asa trying to sit within the right, trying to do good by everyone she can. The world has a ton of nuance, however. Characters, people, feelings, emotions, all have a ton of nuance, all have this moral and ethical ambiguity between it that never really has much of a direction. Nothing is just right or wrong. There is substance, there is context. In a world like Chainsaw Man, this has always been challenged. What is right? What is wrong? What characters can do good things if they have bad things attached and vice versa? It's great when a character like this eye patch dude rocks up saying that he's never done any wrong in his life, yet he cheated on his wife for six months. Asa processes this, hence why I bring up the conversation. She has to understand what this guy is even doing, what's he even talking about, and trying to evaluate if he actually has ever done anything right or wrong. He's just honest, to a detriment, and probably genuinely thinks he hasn't done anything wrong, even while being an absolute loser. This falls into that realm of judgment that Asa has before she gets taken over by war, and it seems practical. Not forceful, it seems, I don't know how to put it, conjoined, like they were prepared for something like this to happen, and War is the one that kind of passes judgement, saying that he's just buying time, and from here you get this crazy escalation into chaoticness. I love the little judgement that Arsa had done, I think it's very vital. 
to her character. I find it cute. I think we're definitely going to explore more of that as time goes by. And it might be safe to say that just with exposure to devils, to the world, to experiencing all of these things, that the black and white slowly starts to merge into a grayish area, which is good. She's still questioning things, but she's not completely lost or out of touch as she might have been in the past. Funny enough, war is probably a really good help with this. You don't necessarily see it, but with the added perspective of war and what they have gone through, but also not passing judgment as quickly as you would think. Naturally, war seems to be chaotic and all over the place and very much aggressive in their approach, but throughout the entirety of the story, that just isn't true. They're selfish and childish and they complain and chuck tantrums and it's very innocent of war to be someone like that. The literal definition of warfare and the combination of horrific weaponry. So the combination between them is very cute and it's definitely safe to assume that the more Asa grows and becomes in tune with war, the more Yoru evolves as well. They start to flesh out a lot more and enjoy the presence of the person that they're inhabiting. Think Benji and Pochita. Yoru having a name is kind of indicative to the human lifestyle. There'd be no reason for her to have a name if she didn't care at least about her own identity. So if people can respect that, and Asa being the first, there's a level of connection there that Yoru probably seeks, I imagine. Think Makima wanting the opposite of what she represented, a family, a loving one, genuine compassion. All of it is interrupted by Katana Man. He's back, better than ever, bursting through the wall. Not before you get these cute little panels of Yoru absolutely bullying Fami. We can concretely say that Fami has no exposure, no awareness to any of the situation or danger that she is in whatsoever. She does not react to Katana Man. She does not react to War's Kick. She just gets thrown around. She tries to call upon Guillotine, who... <laughs> funny enough, has reverted back into the little stone figure statue thing that Fami pulls out. I don't know why or when this happened, it kind of just did. Useless. Absolute abomination. Fami just gets bullied this whole chapter. The most damage she takes isn't from the enemies, it's from war. It's funny, it's quirky, and it's a bit weird. <laughs> that this horseman who is incredibly powerful has no real emphasis to survive or energy to escape or whatever it may be. She's kind of just chilling. It makes me optimistic, very curious even, if she's a lot scarier than we originally intended. This whole time we have seen Fami straight faced, almost sleep deprived, does not have a care in the world. But what if there was something a little bit more dangerous there, a little bit more sinister. But now it turns into a pretty high-octane fight. We're in a bad position. We have Katana Man and Nail, Hammer, Fiend, whatever, versus Asa and War. Fami isn't necessarily out of the fight, and she could easily provide another devil to use. But is this even? Is this fair? Two horsemen versus two fiends? It's hard to tell. Could the three people that we picked up, the loiterers, if you will, could they actually help? Probably not. So I sit here with my fingers crossed, hoping to see war transform and actually do some massive work. Her opponents are not weak. They're not forgettable. They're not something that she can just stomp over. This is a genuine big fight. I need her to do something exceptional. And I think this is a great time to show it off. Now, I would say they are working on a very specific clock, a timer. What I mean by this is that these are only the early reinforcements from public safety. The last people that we want to see rock in in the next handful of chapters, Quan Shi, Yoshida, Fumiko can rock up, I hope she gets the hands, but also anyone else that they have on the way. They're reacting to this very quickly, and why wouldn't they? Their big devil prison complex is getting broken into. Even though we do have a chapter next week, which I'm very happy about, I'm skeptical. I don't know how this fight's going to go down. I have full faith in war to be as powerful as she needs to be. 
especially against these very experienced people. But the people that come after is the ones that we should be worried about. Fami could pull out another big devil, which would make sense, but we might actually find out her restrictions. Then the three loiterers behind, are we going to protect them? And knowing how Arsa kind of functions, it would make sense for her to not let innocent people get caught up in this, even though they tagged along on their own will. It's an odd position, backed into a corner against powerful people, it's going to take a bit of effort to get out of. So, even though I'm skeptical, I am excited to see what Fujimoto does. Ah, well, that provides pretty much all the clarity I can give. If you want more, check out some of this stuff here. I think that's what you're looking for. The more you watch, the more it supports me. I love and appreciate that, and you'll probably enjoy watching it. Now leave me be, I will sit here, continue to rot, and count past my days.